Well, if you got your sword, I'd like you to turn to the First Corinthians. We're going to be settling in chapter six today. Um, last week we talked about the seriousness of the hospital. Uh, let me go back. This we we're talking about the church being a hospital, not a hospital in which children's church. Oh, there. See, man, is it that time already? It is, isn't it? Children, big children. Uh, awesome deal. So anyway, we talked about the hospital being this place where the hospital comes in, and, and we're supposed to not practice this. We're supposed to do this. Like, we're supposed to be a spiritual hospital. And uh, we talked about some of the things about a hospital, but last week we started talking about some serious things about a hospital. Um, there are places in a, in a physical hospital you go that are pretty serious, isn't it? I mean, there's some times when you go to a hospital and it's some serious stuff. And, uh, and I think where we find ourselves in 1 Corinthians is that Paul is there. He is uh, he's talking about some serious things. Once again, Corinthians being a response letter from um, the church, that what he's seen going on. And so he began to talk about it. So last week we talked about uh, immorality in the church. We talked about how, you know, um, we're pretty good about picking the immorality we want to yell and scream about, but we're not willing to look at some of the immorality that we actually have in our church. Come on. And we talked about that, and we talked about some other things. We talked about how there is the authority set up in the church and how it works, and, and we looked about it. And it's not fun stuff to talk about. Um, and then I thought, well, maybe we'll get a break in Chapter 6, but we actually don't. Um, so we're going to get a little a little harder. But this morning when I got up, the Lord kind of put something on my heart, and it's a question that I want to ask you about. Um, so let me read Chapter 6 to you. It's pretty short. I'm going to read Chapter 6 to you, and then I'll, I'll go into this question and and we'll try to tie this all in together. It says, If any of you has a legal dispute against another, do you dare go to a court before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Or don't you know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest case? Don't you know that we will judge angels, not to mention the ordinary matters? So if you have case... If you have a case pertaining to this life, do you select those who have no standing in the church to judge? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there are not one wise person among you who is able to arbitrate between his brothers? Instead, believers go to a court against believer, and that before unbelievers. Therefore, if you have legal dispute against one another, it is already a moral failure, failure for you. Why not rather put up with injustice? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you actually, you act unjustly and cheat, and you do this to believers. Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't you be deceived? No sexual and immoral people, idolaters, um, adulterers, or any uh, practicing homosexuality, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive, People or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. And some of you used to be this, but you were washed and you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Well, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is helpful. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be brought under the control of anything. Food for the stomach and stomach for food, but God will do always... I'm sorry, but God... I'm losing my place. But God will do away with both of them. The body is not for sexual morality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. God raised up the Lord, and he will raise us up by his power. Don't you know that your bodies are a part of Christ's body? So shall I take part in a Christ body and make it part of a prostitute? Absolutely not. Don't you know that anyone joined to a prostitute is one body with her? For the scripture says the two will become one flesh. But anyone joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Run from sexual immorality. For every sin a person can commit is outside the body. On the contrary, the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Some light reading for the day. 
the question I believe that Paul's asking actually for the whole, throughout the whole book of 1 Corinthians is he's asking, what do you really think of the kingdom of God? What do you really think? And, and I think it even goes deeper than that. Let's change it because when we say kingdom of God, maybe we've got some already, some of us think about the future. Some of us are, are maybe have a misconception of what the kingdom of God is. So how about uh, the Christian community? What do you really think of the Christian community? Better yet, let's do it this way. What do you think of the Messianic community? Oh, and by the way, I'm not talking about Messianic Jews. We are part of the Messianic. We believe in the Messiah has come, correct? And his name is Jesus. That makes us a part of the Messianic community. So we are, we are Messiah followers is what we would be called in the Old Testament. Uh, and, and, and what I'm asking you is what do we really think of these things? Because sometimes I think it's easy for us to think of the kingdom of God as something that's going to happen at some point. Sometimes it's, it's easy to think that our community is just made up of right here in this body. And, and we forget that we actually, when we come together and worship, uh, especially in the Western culture, we are worshiping with thousands upon thousands upon thousands of other believers this day in a community. We should be unified under the cross of Christ, right? So what do we really think about this? This is just an interesting thought to me because Paul is saying, if this is real, and I'm going to switch to the kingdom of God. That is my favorite way of thinking about the community, okay? It's God's kingdom. And the reason is, is because a kingdom has to have a what? A king. And we need to be believers to say we have no king but Jesus. So I like to think of it as a kingdom. I also like history. I also like castles. I like big swords. I like armor. I like... So when I think of a kingdom, this is where I'm going in my mind, right? That God has got us together. And it's a different kind of kingdom, though. We, we, we don't use weapons of this world. We use spiritual weapons instead of physical weapons. We practice the gifts of the Spirit instead of practicing things of self. And at least we should. So when I say, what do we think about that? Do we think it's a real thing? I guess maybe that's the question is, and it came from, again, I'm using some things recently from the uh, Truth Project, but do we really believe what we believe is really real? So Paul's asking, do you know what? This is no different than the Corinthian church. I've got to ask that question today, and I have to, and, and Paul was asking it of his day. Do you really believe? He says, okay, if you believe, then there shouldn't, shouldn't there be a difference in the churches versus the world? Like, should we not be seen as different. Got real quiet. We should. So Paul's asking this thing, chapter 5, then why is there immorality in the church? Why are you practicing the same things that the world are practicing? Do you realize that when we start practicing these other things and we stop practicing being the hospital that God calls us to be? It says in Scripture that you can't serve both God and money. We say mammon, but in other words, you can't have two gods. You're either going to serve the one or you're going to or serve the other. You can't have both. We get so locked up in that passage that says it's all just talking about, just talking about uh, money, and it's not. It's talking about are we going to give our lives? We're going to give our lives to something. Do you realize that? Every one of us is going to give our lives for something. It's just, what's it going to be? Is it going to be for a world or the, this world? And, and some, I believe, gave their life for this world, and they also gave it for the kingdom of God. And we can talk about veterans, and we can talk about missionaries, and we can talk about all those who have left their, laid their lives on the line, the martyrs. Yeah, they gave up their physical life, but it was well worth the kingdom. Like, I don't believe you would talk to any martyr if, if, if a martyr were to come and they would say, oh, well, no, it wasn't worth it to me. Being a martyr, there are no regrets. Did you know that? So as I'm sitting here thinking, I'm processing this message because God kind of has me on a different path than I thought I was going to go. So you're going to have to just bear with me as I, there may be some silent issues as God and I are talking, but... um.
Why is it? And let me just get right down to the chase. So he's writing this. He's answering this question. There is obviously something wrong with this, with what's going on in the church because there's people taking each other to court, believers within the same body of believers. Okay? So, and they're going to this, and Paul's asking this question. He's saying, why would you go to the unrighteous? Why would you go to the unrighteous when you are righteous people? Well, I think he's being a little sarcastic here. Okay? I, I, just a tad bit. Because he gets into this, well, don't you know we're going to judge angels? Now, you can get, a lot of people can get caught up into this, okay? Um, where Paul is getting this is from chapters like Daniel 7. So if you look up Daniel 7 um, and you study that, again, I'm not going to read things to you. You're going to have to dig for yourself this week. But he talks about these things. And he's saying that there is a difference between us. He's saying that, see, I don't know if you realize this, by being a part of the community, we believe that we are made in the image of God right? Well, it doesn't say that about angels. We have a different place. I believe in angels. I believe they're around us now. I believe that God, uh, God has uh, used them as messengers, and, has, and you read scripture, and, um, and all these things, and there's, there's an army of angels that are doing spiritual warfare right now over your soul. I believe that with all of my heart, and I believe that if we could see into that dimension in that world, it would scare you half to death of what the enemy is trying to do for your soul and what God is willing to do for your soul. And so this is going on. This is about being part of the community. They're part of our community too. But he's saying, guys, we've been made for a reason. We could get caught up in the lawsuit thing. We could start making legalistic laws in our church about this passage. But what I want to get down is to the meat of the thing. How are we treating one another? And can't we find at least one person within the body to sit and arbitrate between two people? I don't know. It's hard. We think we're so right about so many things. We think we, we know the answers about everything. And the problem is, is can I just admit something right now? I don't have all the answers. I don't. I don't think any of y'all do either. And if you do and you're hiding it from us, shame on you. No. You see, when we begin to dive into this, why were they doing this? Why were they going to court? Why were they doing this? It's obvious. It says, first of all, they were trying to cheat each other. They were trying to get something that they really didn't, didn't need or want, or, or maybe they wanted it, but, but it wasn't part of God's plan. You know, we do that a lot here. We, we take a, uh, people on earth, we take a lot of things that aren't part of God's plan for us, and we think that it's our right. And the reason I say that is because he makes them rather very hard words here, and especially for us uh, in the Western culture, we don't like any of these words. So he's saying, so if you have a problem amongst each other, why don't you just deal with the injustice? Like, if you feel like you're being treated unjustly, why don't you deal with the injustice? Wouldn't it be better to deal with the injustice and keep a relationship than destroy a relationship in a body because of an injustice? Then he goes on to say, and why not just stay cheat? Just take, be cheated. Just be cheated. Is it better to be cheated? I know this is very uncomfortable. The, the vibe in this room just went, Bleh. But the reason is, is because we are so used to, we are so used to living in a society that, that says we deserve stuff. We don't deserve stuff. We don't even deserve the relationship with God that we have. But God said, even if. We sang a song, even if you don't, Lord, even if you don't show up in these ways that I thought you would, even if you don't, I'm still going to love you. I'm still going to serve you. I'm still going to do these things, right? Do you think maybe God's saying that to us 
even if they don't, I still will. I don't know about you, but I just got goosebumps. Because we're humans, we make mistakes. We're a body of believers that gather here and we have issues with each other sometimes. We are a body of believers and there's problems sometimes. Guess what? We all don't get along sometimes. If you're all married, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, good, that lightened the load a little bit. But, but to, to go beyond what God is asking us to do would be just the same as taking someone to the law, to the unrighteous. You see that? You see how that ties in together? We as a church, universal, worldwide, have taken on the moniker of being Christ followers or messianic people. We call them ourselves Christians. And Paul's asking the place where Christians sought to act like Christians, they don't. And I'm here to say that sadly, sometimes the world actually acts more like the church than the church does itself. I know this is heavy, y'all. I'm, I'm not sorry that it's heavy because I didn't write it. You know, I'm just a deliverer of said good news. Um, but there is good news in this. But I've just been, you know, I've been, I've been reading some things. And, and uh, I, I wrote some thoughts down this morning. And I don't even know if I'm going to preach long today, to be honest with you guys. I am, I'm at a point where, um, I, I, I don't know, um, God and I are fighting about something I need to say, and so I'm not really wanting to say it, but I'm sure I will by the end of it, because that's how it usually works. Um, but I want to read these thoughts to you, and, and, and I want you to really think about it. You see, 1 Corinthians is all about the fact that the Christians are to be different from everybody else, and if they're not... They might as well not bother calling themselves Christians in the first place. Those who name the name of the Lord and claim to follow him have an astonishing destiny, but that results in an astonishing responsibility. This passage and in, in Philippians, which I'll read here in a bit, is, is, is written to us to prevent us from asking, where in today's church, my church, are we believing in such a way, or no, I'm sorry, where in today's church, my church, are we behaving in such a way that we are shaming the gospel in the eyes of the world? We sit as a church and we say, well, everything is permissible for me. When he gets into this passage, do you realize that's a popular saying in that day? Guess what? It's a popular saying today. It all works for me. Everything is permissible for me. And when we start going down that road, Paul's using this. This is what was happening in the church. Because remember, the church was so puffed up with pride that they felt that they were above what God was asking them to do. They were above everything. They, they, they didn't have to find morality. They didn't have to find, they could be uh, uh, swindlers and they could be greedy and they could be uh, verbally abusive and all the things that this passage lists. It could do all these things. And it's okay because we've found this thing in God and, and we've used his grace and his opportunity to burn people. And it's okay because I've got this thing covered. But then all of a sudden, he, he, he sits there and he goes, but not everything is permitted. He said, everything is permitted. Do you believe I believe in the freedom of Christ? Everything is permissible for me. I have been bought at a price, it says, a high cost. And I can, I can do what I want. But not everything is beneficial or helpful to me. You see, there's where the spiritual wisdom comes into play. 
I can do what I want. I can say what I want. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. But if I do, how am I going to be received? How am I going to reflect Jesus Christ to those when I say this? You see, being a, 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 a follower of Jesus, it automatically should cause us to stop and think about what we say so that when we say it, we are not destroying people. We're not destroying things that God has put in place. We're not doing things just because we can. We're doing things because we're called. We don't operate in the fruit of the gifts of the Spirit just because it's available. We operate in the fruit of the gifts of the Spirit because He has asked us to, and we do it when and only when He says. You see, these are so important for us to understand because he's looking at this. He says, you say everything is permissible, but not everything is, is beneficial. He says, everything to me is permissible. He says it again, but he goes, but I will not be brought under control over anything because in, as a believer in Jesus, there is one person that has control over my life and it's not my wife. And if I, if I was... A female, I would say it's not my husband, but I'm not, so I couldn't, so I didn't. But what I'm saying is, it's Jesus is the only one that really has control over me. Parents, even your kids, I hate to tell you this, even when they're small, you think you got some control. No, you got boundaries. You got borders. You got baby gates. You, you, you got, you got just things to hold them into place. But the problem is, is deep down inside. I don't know why we, why do we do this to our kids? We, we, we don't think that they're going through spiritual battle as well. You know, our kids are going through just as much battle as we are. Maybe even more because their potential, they haven't been jaded like us. So they got a little purity of mind. They've got a little bit of true, I mean, Jesus said, come to me as little children. Why? Because they believe that God is so big, so great, and so mighty. There's nothing that my God cannot do. We, on the other hand, question how big our God is. I don't. Because I've seen my God take away cancer multiple times. I've seen my God raise the dead throughout history. I'm a little glad it hasn't been personally. It might have freaked me out. But you know what? I've been raised from the dead. Spiritually and physically. My God is a God who ordains stones to be left in a river so a little boy can take down a giant. My God is so big that I don't really care how he created this earth as long as he was involved. See, I don't put God in a box. Well, I say I don't now. But can I confess that I used to? God was so small, he could fit in my pocket. Pull him out when I wanted to. Usually when I was in trouble. Stick them on my dashboard. Hey, Jesus, can you help me now? But that's how the church usually operates. Instead of saying, wait a minute, the kingdom of God is at hand. I love the New Testament because, and Paul especially, because he used to, he said that, the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is at hand. That doesn't mean, that, that means now, that means it's been in operation since he's been here. Since, since Jesus decided that he would somehow leave his self and come down here and sit in a manger that he that, that turned into a throne, his kingdom began. And his kingdom has been operating since then. But really where it took off is when Jesus said, not my will done, but see, he gave us an example, so he went to the cross. 
And I don't know about you, but I'm getting excited because pretty soon we're going we're gonna to celebrate a day in which he came out of the tomb because he's not like anybody else. He is the one and only son of the living God who raises the dead, who does miracles, and who uses people like us, broken and hurt, to do great and mighty things. We have the ability within us to say, I will take an injustice for the glory of God. It's no accident that after he goes into this and says everything is permissible. In other words, I can fight it. I can do everything I want, and it's okay. Matter of fact, he even goes in and says, he uses another one. Well, if the stomach is for food, then the food must be for stomach, right? That was, said, that was an Epicurean saying in the, in the Gnostic belief that he was fighting in this church that said, man, you just got to experience everything in order to find God. doesn't matter if it's written against in Scripture. You experience everything. And so he says, you just eat. You do whatever you want, right? says, no, God has given us a body for one specific reason. It's not for immorality. It's not for greed. It's not for anything else. It is for the Lord and the Lord alone. My God is a jealous God. He's Elkanah. He is the God that will do anything to find you where you're at. Why? Because he looks at you and he says, I sent my son for them. And then it goes on to say this in 14, that God raised up the Lord, amen, and will also raise us up by his power. Now, that doesn't mean when I'm dead. See, that's where the church gets weak. That's where the church begins to not believe in the kingdom. Because if we believe in the kingdom, and I'm a part of the kingdom right now, I am an eternal being, and I will live forever. Maybe not in this plane, but in his plane. Like, so if I really believe in the kingdom, you see, I think that's what made David so powerful on the battlefield with Goliath. Because God had anointed him for something, did he not? He had already been anointed as king of Israel. He had already been given a job and a purpose. He had already been told what he was going to do. I believe we are all David's. We have all been spoken to here. We all know what God wants us to do. We all know what God is asking us to do. We, we know that beyond a shadow of a doubt. Some people say, no, I really don't know. If you would stop for a second, turn off the world. I'm not saying hide. I'm saying turn off the radio, turn off the TV, put the podcast down, put the vlogs down. YouTube will be okay without you holding it in its hand for just a little bit. And, and for some reason, stop in the silence of, God, of, of everything. Maybe go find a patch of woods to go stand in if that's what speaks to you, you know, or whatever. I mean, for me, I'm a music guy, so I'm not going to turn off the music. I'm going to turn up the praise music because to me, that's where God speaks to me, right? And I'm going to find that place and I'm going to ask him, God, what is it? And he will tell me. I don't believe there's a thing that he won't, he will tell me. And if he's silent to me, then he, obviously I'm not ready to hear. And if I'm not ready to hear, I better start digging into the word of God and becoming more like him. I don't sit there and whine about it that God's not talking to me. I figure out why. I don't wait till Sunday for the pastor to tell me why. I actually look it up before, and then I go to church, and I find out the pastor's been talking to God, and all of a sudden, what happens is he's confirming what God is already telling me to do, and I've already been doing it. Therefore, I can find him at the altar, and the Holy Spirit will fall on me in a group of like-minded people because, guess what? That's what he wanted in the first place. He's talking about, in the moment... At that time that God is asking you to maybe take an injustice or to take a, uh, or, 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 or to be cheated or, or to just actually not say a word, to not defend, to do something. In that moment, I believe God is going to show up and he's going to raise you up to the point that you can stand without opening your mouth and being the vessel that God has called you to be. You see... Anything else, anything else besides living that way, Paul writes it, you might as well just join yourself to a prostitute. <laughs> Paul don't mix words, does he? Why? Because we're selling ourselves away from the one who truly loves us. We're, we're, we're trading ourselves in 
for something that's not of God. Now, Paul does set aside sexual immorality as something important here. Let me explain why. He says when we sin, we usually sin outside of our body, right? When I'm dealing with somebody in relationship. Or I usually it's outside of myself. But Paul specifically says, but this sin not just sins against somebody else, it sins against you as well. It tears away at you. And for a long time I said, God, why? I don't understand this. But then I realized it's really not about us. It's about he already, I mean, he calls us, his children, his bride. And when we begin to take these things as more highly sought than him, then we might as well go to a prostitute because we're cheating on him. <laughs> I laugh because it's awkward. <laughs> Sometimes that's how I deal with awkward moments. <laughs> but see, I guess what I'm trying to say is this. jotted some more notes down earlier. Um, in the book of James, chapter 4, verses 2 through 3, it says this. You desire, but you don't have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and you fight. You don't have because you don't ask. And when you do ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your own pleasure. That answers the question of what Paul was saying. He's like, the issue is, is that we want so much but, but, and we desire, but because we don't want to go about it the way God wants us to, it, then, then we kill. And I'm not maybe saying physically kill, but uh, we kill verbally. We, we kill on Facebook. There's been a slaughter and a genocide of people throughout the years because of social media, and it's because people destroy one another verbally, and it's hate-filled, fear-mongering junk that needs to stop that place could be such a peaceful place. Do you realize that place could be a place where everybody goes for encouragement? Because the church, instead of whining and complaining, is giving praise to God for what God has been doing in their lives. Now, I know some people do that that way. Some people don't. The majority of what I see is not what I would call great, so I don't go on it much because guess what? I am sick of a whiny, complaining church. Because I believe in the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God is real. He is so real, as a matter of fact, that in, uh, in Philippians 2, he says, Guess what? Take my weakness for my strength. Paul says, I will boast about what I'm weak in. Because I can't rely on myself, I rely on God to work through me. I believe in the kingdom so much that when he sees me messing up, he says, Whoa, child. And then he stops, and he works with me, and then he says, now go. I don't have to start over. I don't have to go to the beginning. I am bought and paid for at a high price. I want to glorify God in my body, not just in my spirit. So therefore, the spirit that God is doing, working in me, as he teaches me, and he shows me gifts, and as he's del delving deep within me, I want you to know that your pastor has been going under such a, a, a radical change within himself over the past three years of my life that has been difficult sometimes 
for me to get up here and actually give a word because God is changing me. I want you to know this. I'm not bragging. I'm not saying I'm special. I'm saying where God has me right now, I feel like I could walk on water. I feel like I could tear down mountains because it is not him, me doing it. It's the empty grave. It's Jesus on the cross. It's God in heaven. It's Holy Spirit infused in me to say, I will be different. So sometimes, all right, God, fine, fine. There's an elephant in the room. Some people that have left. And I have been accused for not caring because I'm not chasing or running. I only, one, I only run for one person, that's God. And I only worship one person, and that's God. No. I just want you to understand that your leadership of this church has been walking this out for a year and a half or two years. We've done the best we can. Have we made mistakes? Yes. Have I made mistakes? Oh, you betcha. And I've never said, oh, I didn't make a mistake. No, I make plenty. And I guess I can only speak for myself, but those who have left, left has caused a great pain in my heart. Because it wasn't the way God wanted it to be. The way God wanted it to be was to be unified, glorious. But some people have to be wooed to the wilderness because they're not ready for the unity. Take that how you will. I'm probably going to get in trouble for that, but that's okay. What I'm saying is, is that for as best as I can say, Paul says that as best as you can live at peace among every man. So I'm here to tell you, and I will burden, take the burden of whatever, um, that as best as we could, we tried to live at peace. I will not apologize. Sorry. I'll apologize for not apologizing. No. I, I can't because God is on the throne and he's in control. What we need to do now as a church is be a church. That's not slandering one another in a court of opinion, but is standing together in love and unity, locked arm in arm, knowing that we are faulty people. <laughs> I told you a long time ago that uh, I had some great advice from a pastor friend. He said, oh man, church is awesome. Working for a church is great as long as there's no people. But the minute I step in the room, even in an empty building, I've caused a problem because I've stepped in. So I don't take that as we pastors are on. No. Please. You guys know my heart. I want us to glorify God as we walk in the spirit, but I would like us to glorify God as we deal with one another in the body. I know I'm taking this scripture a totally different way than Paul did, but to me, this is, this is what he's asking. He's saying, can we stand together and can we be the, can we be, people. Last, last uh, week I talked about how uh, what Paul was asking for, can we have a table fellowship? In other words, can we sit down together, have the communion without guilt in us, without shame in us, saying we are doing what we can. I mean, I know we're going to make mistakes, but guess what? Our identity is not our mistakes. You, you started it right off. Our identity is not our mistake. Our identity is what was bought and paid for at a high price. Actually, it says that you were bought with a price in, in, in this, but when you go to the other translations and you actually get down to the, to the Hebrew uh, alignment of it, it is you are bought with such a dear, dear, dear price. You are worth it to God. Your identity, you know, when you sin... 
after following Christ, God, I'm even going <sighs> to... Okay, I got to go there. Sorry. Here it is. I feel like we're, we're still fighting identity issues in the building. Okay? I think we are. All right? If we've confessed with our mouth the Lord Jesus, let me give you a little, little basic Christianity 101. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, he is faithful and just to do what? Forgive us of our sins. Scripture also says when he forgives, how, how, how far does he forgive? East is from the west. We can't draw a point in where we can find the actual west, unless you're a Louis L'Amour book, then I know where that's at. But I'm talking like in life, in universe. Uh, I have a, a cousin who is an astrophysicist who studies wormholes and time travel. He's a believer, by the way, and has led more people to the Lord than I probably ever will in my whole entire mystery, ministry. Why? Because he proves science that God is real. And these things are possible. But as he talks, it's such a, the universe is such an infinite thing. You know, we are finding every day more and more galaxies. Like every day. I, I want to say that something like 25 galaxies a day. Some, every day, the universe is expanding. Why is that? Is it so that we can go far, far away and find, and find people who can sleep in a bed for 12 months and be okay? No. It's to prove that God is ever expanding and we will never find his limits of creativity or that we'll ever find the end of who God is. So God, as he sees you struggle in life as a follower, I'm going to say this, and you can disagree, I don't believe he sees your sin. I believe he sees your struggle. He can't. You have been bought with such a dear, dear, dear price. So stop looking at the thing you're struggling is as who you are and say, you know what? That is who I used to be. But God is in the process of transforming me so that I can be made whole and complete. I'm already made in his image. We can already see God within us and now he is going to complete the task. Don't you know that you are the sanctuary of the Holy Spirit? Woo! He doesn't look at my filth. He sees me as a temple and as a sanctuary. Visualize that in your head for just a second. Because even the visualization blows me away. I just talked about castles and knights and shining armor, right? Think about the temples and the things, the humanly that we think is beautiful. To me, one of the most beautiful things, the best temple I have ever been at, is called the Grand Canyon. God carved out his own temple. And he said, it is good. But you know that came out of a sin, right? Because it probably wasn't there until the flood think about it. That means that what he wants to do in our lives through the stuff we're struggling with is make it into a greater, better temple. But we have to go through it. We can't be afraid of it. God ordained five smooth stones for David and I to, to knock down that giant. One giant, five stones. I don't care why there was five except for five is the number of what, John? Grace. Right? <laughs> God was saying, through the grace of God, I'm going to take down that giant. And then that 14 little old boy who stood out in front had the strength to pick up the man's sword that was probably four times the boy's size. Boy probably shouldn't have been able to lift it. Remember, this is a poet now and a songwriter. They're usually not the biggest and buff guys. But all of a sudden, he was able to do it, and then he cut off the head as a physical sign of saying, it is finished. And what happened? Fear left the camp. What was holding him in? Fear. They were so scared of this giant who was coming out and whooping on them verbally all day that they couldn't figure it out. 
but David, a little boy who said, today, probably like that. Today, God is going to hand me your head, Philistine. And they're going to know that David's the greatest? No. Because they're going to know that there is a God in heaven by what I do today. Are we going to allow that to happen in our life today? To say, today, devil. Oh, yeah. Today, devil. God is going to deliver your head to me. Not for my benefit, not so that I look great. I could care less because I'm bought and paid for with a price. I'm a slave to Christ. I'm telling you why. It's because this whole universe is going to scream out, there is a God in heaven who cares about us, who loves us, who will prosper us, who will lead us into victory. It is finished. It is done. And he's asking you, will you come? Will you come to the table with him? So today, as we've talked about hard things, Jason's going to come and close, but I want you to listen to what God puts on his heart because I say this all the time, but I think we're interchangeable. I think I'm the better looking, but that's beside the point. But God, I know, has placed something on his heart for us to finish off today, and we're going to worship together. He's talking about something awkward like sexual immorality. He can't close because he has to go over here. <laughs> he knew where he was going. You can't tell me that he just had to play in the band. Does anybody else feel like this has been a weird church service? Like awkward as all get out? I promise you, I don't intend to make it any less awkward, right? <clears throat> so I've been reading this book about this guy. I may have told you all this already. I, I get really confused sometimes. I get excited up here. About a guy that's been searching for the Ark of the Covenant, okay? And as he's searching for it in the book, it's a really thick book. He talks a lot about, he uses the Bible a lot. Later I learned he's not a believer, but he uses the Bible a lot. But he also uses um, some Jewish books and writings and teachings that are apart from the Bible. And so real quick, I want to talk to you about the Ark of the Covenant, because it's really cool. You all know what the Ark is, right? It's got the tablets in it. It's got the cherubims on it. And you know that God resides between those when, when he's in Israel, right? All right, so that thing, that it does some really cool stuff. You know, when the, the, the rabbis walk out into the Jordan River with it, the water stops and they walk through on dry ground. Like when they walk around the walls of Jericho carrying it, the walls come down. I mean, this thing, when they take it into battle, they are un. They cannot be defeated when it's with them, right? For a long time. And they, they put it away. They hide it away. Anyways, eventually it disappears. And nobody can understand why. And why doesn't the Bible talk about where it went? I mean, it's this important relic. And so I was reading this book, and this guy writes all this stuff about all this stuff it did. And it began to dawn on me why God took it away from them. You see, the Jewish people began to believe the ark had power. And they began to worship the object, not the God who resided on top of it. And there's something cool that he talks about in this book that the early church took Mary and put her standing on top of the ark because they said Mary became the new ark of the covenant when she had Jesus inside of her. She became the living ark. But then God said, I don't want people to worship the golden ark anymore, and I don't want them to worship Mary. So do you realize where the new ark resides? It's here. See, Jesus, or God, he had to take the ark away so people wouldn't focus on it. And today, God wants to remove you and let His Holy Spirit be what resides in here so that His power can come out of within here. The problem is what he's talking about here, sexual immorality and these things. And then Jason went to James and he read about uh, we do things out of the wrong motives. It's because we're worshiping at the idol of self. 
Why does he talk about sexual immorality? Because that's one of the worst problems that we have in culture, right? Because it gratifies me. I get the benefit of that. Why do we come to church? Are we worshiping at the idol of church? Are we worshiping at the idol of Pastor Jason? Are we worshiping at the idol of the worship team? Or are we worshiping at the idol of look at me? The problem with the church is that we worship at the idol of self. I need a pastor to feed me. I need a worship band to worship for me. You are the new Ark of the Covenant. God wants to come and reside on you. But if you're so busy worshiping the exterior thing instead of the God that fills it and resides in it and gives it its power, its purpose, and its meaning, then you're going to miss what God has in store for you in your life. God wants to remove your selfishness from the equation. The question is, are you willing to let him?